Welcome to Elected, a podcast for women in and around politics. I'm your host, Sarah Elder Chaminara, and this week our guest is Mercedes Stevenson, the host of Global's West Block. In the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksiksa, the Kainai and the Pekani, the Zutina, the Stony Nakoda Nation, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their home in the Tree 7 region of Southern Alberta. Today, Elected's second guest is Mercedes Stevenson, someone on the Canadian media and political landscape that all of us know when we turn on the TV. She is the Ottawa Bureau Chief for Global and the host of the political news show West Block. Mercedes has a Bachelor in Political Science from the University of Calgary and a Master's also from the USC from the Centre for Military and Strategic Studies. She also studied economics and media ethics at Georgetown and worked as an intern at the Pentagon and was a visiting research student at the MIT Center for International Studies. Hi, Mercedes. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Thank you for being a guest on Elected. I'm so incredibly honored. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. (laughs) Thank you. Um, So I, when I started because I, everyone knows you as, you know, the host of West Block, but not ever, I'd never, you know, read your bio bio before. And so when I started getting into it, I was like the, the military and strategic studies was really interesting. And I actually went on the website to see, I was like, <laughs> I think I want to do this too. Um, I and then recommend to see, it. It's a fun degree. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, and then to see that you were an intern at the Pentagon, that's, amazing. Um, I don't know. I, not enough people know this. Like, I feel like you could do potentially your own show on kind of your own history because that's super fascinating. It was, it was, um, a really shaping time because it was right after nine 11. Oh, um, yeah, I'm old. So <laughs> I was an intern, uh, the year after nine 11, it was 2002 and, um, coming from Calgary, Alberta, to Washington, D.C., um, which felt like a city under siege still at that point, especially in the Pentagon, there was still damage from the attack. Um, On the first day at work, I opened my computer and there was a description of someone who had been in the Pentagon when it was attacked and they had written it up on what it was like trying to find their colleagues and see if they were safe and alive. Um, There were Humvees parked outside my work. We had snipers on the roof. Um, on the first day I came into work, there was a lovely Southern soldier on the front door and he had the biggest gun I'd ever seen. And I asked him, what kind of gun is that? <laughs> and he looked at me and said, sweetheart, this here is a grenade launcher. Oh my goodness. And I thought, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, but I absolutely loved the experience. Um, I was on the broadcasting side there. It was because I was doing um, an internship in journalism and I knew nothing about journalism. I wasn't a journalism student, but one of my profs told me I should be a journalist. And I ended up getting into this program, which I never thought would happen. And then thought, well, how can I say no to a summer in Washington? Yeah. Um, so I went down and it was really a transformative experience in terms of understanding the American um, psyche after 9-11, how personal it felt for them, how fearful it was, uh, the way that they felt they'd been attacked and, and having the opportunity to spend a lot of time uh, with enlisted members and non-commissioned officers in the U.S. military, not on the officer side and getting kind of a sense of that culture um, has really helped me in my journalistic career because I had the academic understanding of the military at that point, but I didn't really have the hands-on perspective of having worked with them. So uh, I really enjoyed it. Contrary to some of the theories on Twitter, um, Mm -hmm. I'm not a CIA plant up here, Mm -hmm. I was trained by the Pentagon at a young age. I was working for soldiers radio and television, which is their broadcasting arm. Um, And as a foreigner, uh, which was very rare in the Pentagon, working for the Pentagon. And by the way, we were offsite um, in, a, in a place in Virginia that was right next to uh, where the so-called surviving 9-11 terrorist, uh, Musawi, was being tried. 
Um, but it, it really gave me a different sort of perspective. And a lot of my job was frankly reading stuff like check your tires before you go on your summer road trip. Is your oil up to date? Because there's only certain things a foreigner can do. Uh, but just being embedded in that culture was a huge learning experience for me. Yeah, that is so incredibly fascinating. And to be there in that time right after 9-11, um, yeah, I, I'm sure that was a like a life shaping kind of experience um, outside of like what it's done for you in, in journalism, but just as you as a person. So. Yeah, it was it was it really um I think it gave me more of an understanding of sometimes why America behaved the way it did, which had been mm -hmm. very at times confounding and confusing as a Canadian, even though we're in some ways very similar, we are different. And having an opportunity to live there and work there and talk to people and just get to know them and, and how they felt at a, at a fundamental human level, not mm -hmm. all the politics and, and all the other stuff was uh, a really incredible experience that I'm very grateful for. Well, and imagine how the world of politics would be better if we just did that more often, right? Just, you know, set all of that stuff aside and, you know, understood, maybe tried to understand on a more deeper, just human level, <laughs> there would probably be a lot less conflict in the world. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a little bit less partisan, maybe not yeah. as fun for the partisans, but uh, exactly. You know, and, and I still believe that. I think you really, in politics, have to look for the humanity. And um, I do believe that the vast majority of people who go into politics, I'm, I'm still not cynical, I guess, after all my this time, I should be. But um, I think they go in because they want to make the world a better place. And people just have different versions of what that looks like based on their life experience and their opinions but they 100%. all genuinely i think want the best for for, for canadians I, I totally 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 agree with you it's just that we have different yeah we have different understanding or people have different understandings of you know what they believe to be right and wrong and um you know but at the same time, there's, I think, a lot of room for a conversation because there are a lot of people who are so partisan and so into this, into their own ideology that they don't want anyone to disagree with them. And that happens on both sides. And I don't think, I mean, there are examples in the world of, you know, of states where you actually don't have a choice and you can only really subscribe to, you know, one way of being. And that's also very dangerous um, in a way that I don't think most people understand as well. So like having room for thought and then, but yeah, understanding that people might have the same idea of things, but just how it's applied is different, right? Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, I say to people, I, I enjoy living in a country where the politics are boring. So right. to speak. Yes. Um, it's it's <laughs> what we consider a scandal is not what most countries would consider a scandal. That is that is a benefit. That's a huge advantage. Um, like Bev Oda's orange people. juice, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> so, Bev Oda's orange juice. Uh, you know, it's and, and that's not to say that there are not serious ethical issues in this country and scandals right. that have come up and they need to be treated very, very seriously because we want to hold our politicians to the highest accountability. Uh, but I've been to countries where people die when they're in line to vote mm -hmm. um, and where you know, women are killed if they mm -hmm. want to vote, uh, where the politics are violent and people speak in the language of guns and bombs, um, not just bombastic political rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very grateful for the political system we have. It is far from perfect, mm -hmm. um, but you know what? It's, it's pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, my husband is originally from Iran. Um, and I've been to Iran twice and actually oh, wow. I'm a, a dual citizen strain. <laughs> That's um, amazing. Um, and so are our, we have two children and they're both dual citizens as well. And so I have a little bit of a perspective on that as well. Just having, you know, um, having had the privilege to travel there and to, you know, even at the airport, for example, um, my husband and I can't wait in line together. We have to go through different security checkpoints, one for women and one for men. And that's just, you know, that is like the tippity, tippity, tippity top of the iceberg in terms of like re very real differences. Um, and just, yeah, the daily lives of, of, of people in different countries where we take a lot of things for granted here. Um, but where did your interest in the military and strategic affairs come from? Like what, 
what mo- what what ha- what happened in your life that that became <laughs> something you like that <laughs> yeah well no and in the most amazing way like where did this love of of this area come from so two parts um part one was 1999 the crisis in Kosovo was happening mm-hmm. um and I've always been fascinated in in international affairs and in conflict I remember watching the Gulf War as a kid on CNN uh, my mom being a little concerned that that seemed potentially abnormal and that I might be upset by what I was watching, but I can still see it sitting on my parents' bed in my head. I remember sitting there cross-legged watching early CNN um, and where you could see at night where the firing was was taking place with the tracers uh, going across and the explosions. And, and then um, in 99, when Kosovo happened, um, refugees were coming to Canada. And the church that uh, my parents and I were attending at the time brought in a refugee family. And I volunteered to help to sort of acclimatize them to Canada, um, and deal with the Red Cross, look for their family members who were missing in the war, um, put the kids in school, learn English, all this kind of stuff. And I was just so fascinated by their incredible strength to come to a country where they didn't speak the language, didn't share the culture, Uh, were in a minority for the religion and had come from a city that they told me was relatively well integrated before the war. And they really suffered on three fronts. They they were confronted by the KLA as Kosovars who did not want to fight. Uh, That did not go down well. Um, They were being attacked uh, as well in the war. They were targets and their house actually was hit uh, by a NATO bomb, they told me. And they showed me pictures of Um, basically the brass doorknobs being left and and that was it. And here were these people who had a totally normal life, you know, a butcher and a midwife, and it's completely uprooted, family members um, killed in front of them in a refugee camp and then in Canada trying to readjust. I thought, how does that happen? How does that happen? These are now, this is suddenly a real person who I know who's Mm -hmm. been through this. Um, And that really got me interested in conflict and the effect that it has on people and why does it happen? um, And how do you protect people who are innocents in that? Um, And so at that point, I I thought I wanted to be an international human rights lawyer. And so there's sort of, you know, going down that path, went to University of Calgary and I have always done speech and debate. And one day, Um, the military and strategic studies club showed up and said they were having a debate on whether or not women should be in the combat arms and allowed to fight on the front lines. And they basically didn't have anybody who wanted to argue for that. And I was like, well, one. To argue for women being on the front lines. Yeah. They had no one to argue that point. This is 99. Okay. Very (laughs) early in integration of women in, in the Canadian forces into combat arms. Um, and in, I mean, it's still happening in, in some of the allied countries, like in the right. U S right. So, I mean, it, it's shocking to us, but it is, uh, a, or a just even that there would be no one, no one willing to argue that position, even without, you know, right. Actually, even you can argue something without supporting it. Right. In some yeah. cases. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. this was, you know, women, it, for the million different reasons that people come up with on women, why women allegedly can't do this, uh, despite the fact there are women in the Canadian Armed Forces, you know, right now, as we're speaking in combat arms roles who do an absolutely phenomenal job. And we've had one, one female Canadian special forces operator um, that, that I'm aware of. Um, so I said, sure, of course, I'll argue that. Number one, I believe it fundamentally mm-hmm. so it's easy for me number two I'm a debater so like I'll debate anything let's debate so we went and did it and um David Berkerson was there who was running the center for military and strategic studies and he came down and said you have a real aptitude for this stuff if you ever thought about it and I thought well like boring military history uh, no thank you um and he told me there was a trip for students going to NORAD that the university was basically supplementing wow. so it was pretty cheap um, and I was actually writing an essay on ballistic missile defense at that time. So I thought, hey, that's what better way to do the research. I went down and I was honestly blown away. This was right before 9-11 um, by what they told us about threats to North America, because I'd never heard that mm. growing up in Canada. Like no one had talked to me about Canada being at risk for a ballistic missile or a terrorist attack. Um, and these were... And in the pre-9-11 context, even. Pre-9-11. Pre-9-11, when I 
when I switched into that field, people told me that I was crazy and I was never going to have a job because it's not relevant for Canada. No one's ever going to attack us. Um, I, I wish that there were no jobs for people like that here. That right. would be great, but it's not realistic. And it just yeah. really changed my perspective um, on the world when I heard this stuff and actually was up close to the military for the first time, really. Um, and they, they were not the stereotype I had in my head of what I thought military people were going to be like. They were totally normal. They were just like us. Yeah. Uh, because guess what? There are other Canadians. They're just close to NORAD. Um, and they weren't fear mongering and whatever else. They're very factual. And like, here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. And I- The kind of people that you would want to be in those roles. Right? It, yeah, exactly. The kind of people I want deciding what you shoot down and what exactly. you Exactly. Uh, yeah. and, and it gave me a lot of confidence in them, but it really opened my eyes to how complacent uh, we had become as Canadians on the security threats here. And I think mm -hmm. we're, we're a little bit less complacent now, but I think we still don't always fully encompass that, whether it's, it's right-wing extremism now and, and neo-Nazi groups in many cases, there was the ISIS concerns. I mean, it's not going to go away. And I felt that that was something important for Canadians to understand, in particular Canadian women, mm -hmm. because what, what drove me crazy was the idea that women aren't interested in security and defense because, you know, they're women and they'd rather um, talk about their families or, I don't know, crafting or something. <laughs> Why can't you have multiple interests? Uh, if you were a mother, I would assume that you're interested in the safety and welfare of your children. Like mm -hmm. this idea that women don't have a place or aren't interested in security. Um, I think the anti-establishment in me was attracted to that too, because I just felt like that's ridiculous. It's everyone's concern. Um, it really. is ridiculous. It is so ridiculous. I'm just nodding my head, like constantly in agreement. That is absolutely crazy. It's like, um, you can do women, women can do all the things we can do all the things we cannot be interested absolutely. in all the things, yeah, right? We can think about all the things at once. There's yes. Things in our brains. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. Um, that's so fascinating though. I, this is just so interesting to hear from you and then, okay. So what came first reporting from Afghanistan or being an embedded journalist in Niger? So Afghanistan came first, that was okay. 2010. Um, it was during Mushtaraq, uh, which was one of the largest NATO operations, definitely largest NATO air operation in history. That's when we were getting hit by IEDs consistently. Uh, I actually was there about a month after Michelle Lang was killed, um, another journalist from Calgary. And I was with the crew who'd survived that bomb. Oh my goodness. Me. Um, I'm still in touch with quite a few of them, which is amazing and so special. And I value them. And they are the reason why I'm here and alive. Their mm. careful eyes, their careful driving, and us getting really lucky. And when you say crew, then you're not talking about media crew, but you're talking about like Canadian Armed Forces. I'm talking about, yeah. yes, the lab crews, uh, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, King's Own Calgary Regiment um who were out there these were the same soldiers uh who were with michelle uh wow. and her her and their colleagues uh when they were killed that day and so that was a pretty uh intense emotional experience i mm -hmm. think for them too to have to take out another female journalist from calgary on the roads mm -hmm. um and we were very fortunate everything was okay everybody came back healthy and safe i am eternally grateful uh, to them for keeping us safe. Um, and it also highlights, I think, that challenge that we face as journalists in a war zone because you're dependent on people for your survival and you're also covering them. Um, I was covering them in a different way then. I was writing opinion pieces and I was doing documentaries. I wasn't in a straight up reporting role. Whereas when I went to Niger, uh, I was there as uh, someone making a documentary for W5. It was a straight up reporting role. Um, that was the first television embed with the Canadian Special Forces. In fact, it's, it's uh, the only full embed they've ever done. We hmm. were living with them in the desert, in Agadez, in the Sahel, um, in the heart of, you know, ISIS territory up around there and Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb for not an extended period of time, but uh, we were there with them for several days. And it was just absolutely fascinating. I really enjoyed that experience, too. 
Man, you, you're really making me want to get into journalism. <laughs> yeah, you should. It's a great field. And people always say, oh, it's collapsing. Don't go into journalism. No, it's never been more important that we have more people in this field. There's always room for good ideas. There's oh. always room for good journalists. And it's so important. I don't know how, I mean, obviously this is another thing, but like being a woman, right. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I have two small children, so, you know, I was like, Hey, mommy's going to, you know, you know, this very dangerous place and I love you very much. And <laughs> hopefully I'll see you soon. Um, yeah, that would, that's definitely, that would be a big consideration, but it's so fascinating. And I think, I mean, it's, it's journalists like you who go to those places and put your life on the line and, you know, show us back at home, what's really going on. Um, and I, that's, that's, there's, that's invaluable. I don't think anyone can put a price on that. So I thank you for, for doing those things and for having those experiences, even though they maybe not weren't, they weren't always easy. Right. It wasn't always. Thanks. I yeah. It's it's not. Um, you know, I don't even know if I can say it wasn't easy. It was. I loved every minute of it. Yeah. Even the really hard stuff. Um, I'm profoundly grateful for those experiences and yeah. uh, for the people who made them possible for us. Because this is a day and age when um, it used to be you could walk around and it said press on on your you know yes. bulletproof vest and that kept you safe. Now it makes you a target. Mm -hmm. It's very different world and it's much harder for us unfortunately to get out and cover some of the stuff that we need to um because your likelihood of being kidnapped in certain areas is very very high if you don't have some kind of um protection but i'm i'm super grateful for all of those experiences and uh i i do them all in a second and i covid has slowed that down um but i really am passionate and i feel like it's a huge privilege to be able to tell canadians these stories about what's mm -hmm. happening in parts of the world that it's just not possible for everybody to go and travel to yeah no and that's the kind of insight that i think um we need more people to be exposed to because it really can change it takes us out of the insular thinking of like oh you know i'm here in calgary and today i have to go to the grocery store and i have to you know pick my kids up from school and um, I have this big meeting this week in a project, but like across the world, um, there are some very serious things happening and they have global consequences and eventually they might just trickle down to where we are, but, um, it's good to have that awareness, but so, okay. So you were in Afghanistan. Um, do you have any thoughts then on what's happening with like withdrawal of troops by mm. the U S do you think that's like, ugh. Are you supportive of that decision or do you like, what are your thoughts on it? I think I have conflicting feelings on it. Um, and part of this is just knowing a lot of Afghanistan veterans uh, mm. and watching how they're reacting. And, and then they're by no means all in one camp or all in the other. Um, I don't think Afghanistan ever had the resources that we needed to put into there for it to be successful. I think that the war in Iraq pulled a lot out um, that would have had to have been poured in. Um, I think that there wasn't clarity of conscience when we went there on, on what we were trying to really achieve. And so we kept going from message to message and asking people in Afghanistan to put their lives in the line to back the coalition when they knew we'd likely do exactly what we're doing. I actually wrote my master's thesis on um, information operations in Afghanistan and mm. why we failed so badly. Uh, part of it is just that the Taliban lies with impunity and we can't do that. A lot of it was that we didn't understand the Afghan population. Um, we didn't understand the culture. And frankly, that we weren't committing to the things we were telling them. And it wasn't that they just wouldn't listen. It's that they could see that, um, you know, okay, you're saying one thing and you're doing another. You have a Burger King on the base. I don't have basic electricity or right. food. Um, I think it's really sad because having been to Afghanistan and, and nowhere near the amount of time that many journalists have spent there and soldiers, mine is a drop in the bucket. Um, but having had the opportunity to meet some of the people who live there, I feel for them. The people who wanted girls to be able to go to school, mm -hmm. um, the people who wanted peace. The history of Afghanistan told us that was always unlikely. I don't think that it was necessarily unachievable, but I don't think that the way that we fought the war made it possible for a lot of reasons. And my heart breaks for all of the veterans who came home fundamentally changed 
PTSD, operational stress injuries, missing limbs, uh, serious brain injuries that have an impact on people for the rest of their lives, friends who never came home. Um, and I know that there's a feeling of, of tremendous grief and frustration, whether people think the war was worth it or not, that there's a feeling that they poured all, did you pour all of that in and now it was all for nothing? Did you pour it in and you did accomplish something? Um, did you pour it in, but you think now is the time to stop or the time not to stop? It's a really complicated area for people and how they feel about it. Um, and I can see all the sides that I, I think it's sad that Afghanistan is where it is today. Yeah, there was just that bombing, not even was it within a week ago, um, and it targeted yeah. a girl's school. And, you know, that's, um, are we better off or worse off? It's, I, it is complicated. It's really, it's, it's yeah. a, a really unfortunate situation. Um, you're one of I, in my mind, kind of a host or you're in a club, a very cool club of very <laughs> cool. The first time I've been in a cool club in my no. life. No. <laughs> okay. Well, you're in a cool club with some very cool or some, with some other very interesting women on the Canadian media stage. So I'm thinking about like Katie Simpson, um, Vassie Capellos, Rosemary Barton, Adrian Arsenault. I feel like we're, um, this is kind of like women and media in the Canadian landscape is like a building force. Do you kind of feel that, like, do you see that as well? Or the Canadian, the, 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 especially on the political side, on the political side, that things are changing and the way the people doing the reporting of politics is, doesn't look the same as it used to. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember when it was mostly male bureau chiefs in Ottawa, um, you know, I remember when, when Pamela Wallen was a bureau mm. chief for CTV, that was a really big deal because she was a woman. It's no longer a big deal to be um, a woman who's a bureau chief in Ottawa. There's, there's plenty. Um, and there's plenty of women now covering politics and um, hosting the political shows, as you said. Like if you, if you look at the political shows, um, you've got well, Vashi's on maternity leave right now, mm -hmm. but the two political shows over at CBC being hosted by women, uh, mine obviously is a woman. Um, and then we have our, our friend and colleague, Evan Solomon, who's over at CTV. But I mean, that wasn't the case a few years ago. It was mm -hmm. all men hosting these shows, or sometimes there'd be a woman who was a co-host, uh, but usually not the main host. And it certainly wasn't more women than men. So I think that it is it is changing. Um, that said, I think we still really lack diversity. I mm -hmm. think that you see it when you look at the press gallery uh, and the coverage that it's 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 a very non-diverse place. There are women, we are mostly white women. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot of change that still needs to happen there um, to accurately reflect Canada and ask the kind of questions that hold politicians accountable from different perspectives mm -hmm. and different lived experiences that that we just you don't know it if you don't know it you have to have that inclusivity um and not just inclusivity but that equality for people to ask questions and and to um hold politicians accountable so i think we're still coming up short um overall but i am really glad to see that there it's no longer a time when it's a big deal to be a woman who's covering a political file. And I think that that's a healthy thing and a good mm. thing. Do you notice a, like a difference in the questions that uh, female journalists ask versus male? Is there like, are there different approaches that, you know, and I'd that's, say a everyone, very, that's a very general thing, but yeah, I think everyone has their own style. Yeah. Um, and I also think you'll see very different styles with different journalists, depending on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, you might see them being very soft and compassionate and eliciting answers in one circumstance and very tough and aggressive in another one. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily, it's clear that there's different questions, but I think that there are different thought processes behind it, or there might be a different approach or different awareness of what you might want to ask about. Mm. Um, I think that people tend to assume, oh, women are, are softer than men in their questions. I've never seen that. Um, I've, I've seen that they are just as tough uh, and, and certainly can be tougher. It's, it's not um, 
a male female thing in that but i think there's a different perspective that women bring to politics and to journalism because there's a different experience there um and I think that it's great that we're no longer kind of surprised when we see the woman asking a question and, and we shouldn't be, <laughs> but unfortunately that was the way that it was for many years uh, and it's shifted, but that goes to that deep held feeling I have that we need to have people from many different backgrounds around the table to inform the kinds of questions that we're asking. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, that's very true. And I hope that especially in the coming like in the very short term that changes um a lot um if you were to give me one interview tip um what would be what would it be and why Make or anyone who's in a position of you know yeah. potentially asking a really hard question or um getting an interesting answer what would that be i think it's getting the person comfortable okay um if somebody is profoundly uncomfortable going into an interview you will have an uncomfortable experience and it won't be a dialogue um and so there's there's times when that needs to happen right there's certain accountability interviews where um you're gonna get grilled if you don't answer the question we'll keep asking that question but i think it's it's a combination of making the person feel comfortable if you want to actually get answers and not just lines but for someone to be human and actually tell you what they think and maybe get off their talking points, although that's harder and harder in politics nowadays. Um, but it's it's that. And I think it's also don't be afraid to ask the question that your gut tells you to ask. Hmm. You know, I think we can get um, overly academic and, and then we have to go to this, then we have to go to that. Listen, listen to the answers that someone's giving you and ask the question based off of what they're saying and let that guide you rather than sort of um, an artifice of the X number of topics. I certainly have gotten caught in this, by the way, many times. This is not, this is like, do as I say, not as I sometimes do, uh, where you feel you have to cover off a certain number of topics with somebody, but to really like, let it be a conversation when you can. Um, and that doesn't mean letting someone off the hook. That means following up because you're listening when they don't ask the question to say, okay, that's really interesting answer but that actually has nothing to do with the question that i just asked you um and also through that listening i think sometimes people feel that they can open up a little bit more and maybe go somewhere they wouldn't but honestly it's very tough with politicians now um to get them to do that and and an interview with a politician is a fundamentally different creature than an interview with pretty much anybody else why do you why do you think it's beca becoming harder for to get a politician off their talking points i think that there's a culture of risk adversity and centralization in politics there are acceptable things to say and you say them over and over and over again whether they make sense or not um and I think it's a huge frustration, not only for us as journalists, but for Canadians, because I've had people say, well, you could ask what someone had for breakfast and they wouldn't answer you. And it feels like that some days. They tell you breakfast is a very important meal. You should eat your breakfast. Yes, but <laughs> that's a very good you, answer. <laughs> was it oatmeal? Was it toast? Was it an egg? Like, I just want to know what you had for breakfast. Um, and All I think breakfast that, is a good breakfast. <laughs> Well, it's it's a polarization in politics where people are afraid that any kind of movement will be seen as a weakness. Um, I think it's a lack of willingness to allow ministers to have accountability and to be responsible for their files, whether that means being allowed to actually say what they're working on and what they think, uh, which also has the counter side of it means you have ministerial responsibility and you might have to fall on your sword if things go wrong. I mean, ministers used to resign when things mm -hmm. went wrong in their department, not just with them, that's gone. Uh, Prime Minister's office has become progressively more powerful and centralizing with every government that we've seen in recent history. Um, it becomes more and more and more about what the PMO says and for the opposition parties, what the party, you know, the, the leader's office tells you to say. Um, and it's not the days anymore when you could just sort of walk up and ask the question and you'd get an answer. I mean, if you watch these old newscasts, it's remarkable what mm. some of these politicians would say on camera because they'd answer the question. Well, um, and maybe even smoking like a cigarette, right? <laughs> like yeah, in a back hall somewhere, wearing <laughs> like dark, dark glasses. Yeah, yeah, it was, 
it was a different time. And I think honestly, the pandemic has made it so, so much worse because mm. we've lost scrums. Yes. Um, we used to just kind of like lurk. I had spent a lot of time stalking the hallways on Pearl and Hell looking and for someone. And now you can't. Eventually, you I have find to them. schedule something, right? Yeah. Which, Which means gives they them to say no. Or gives them, you know, the opportunity just to prepare or way more or it's a statement. It's not, you know, there's no yeah. act of surprise. There's less they limit yeah. questions so yeah. that we have to split them, which prevents follow-up questions, which prevents you pinning somebody down. It allows them to just give those talking points. I know my other colleagues in the gallery struggle with this too. And it's just, um, it's incredibly frustrating because our access is being affected by the pandemic and yeah. there are uh, and it's not just one party that's taking advantage of that um and i don't think that that's healthy so i'm really looking forward to everyone being vaccinated in the day that we can scrum people in person again and i can hide behind pillars waiting for people to walk into question period <laughs> yes well we missed i missed i miss seeing that on the news you know someone coming down the stairs with a binder and you know, trying to get the questions in and seeing them walk into the room, cabinet room, you know, not saying anything or, you know, maybe saying something like that's, we're better off um, as Canadians when you have the access to ask those hard questions. So I want to see, I want well, life to return to normal in many ways, but that's one of the things on the, on the media side that I'm hoping to see as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So now you're on West Block, um, and what, like, what, what do you think Mercedes Stevenson is doing in 10, 10 years from now? Are you still, are you still there? Are you embedded somewhere? Like, do you have an idea of what you want to do <laughs> in the future? I, I, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, my I don't want to see my philosophy because that makes it sound way too intentional and thought out it, it, the way that I have gotten through my career and my life so far. I've said yes to opportunities. Um, and that's always been my number one piece of career advice to young journalists, like to say yes. Um, especially to young women, say yes. Don't do the I'm not qualified thing. You'll figure mm -hmm. it out. Trust me, everyone is figuring it out. Uh, everyone is faking it till they make it. You're smart, you're capable, you can do it, say yes. Uh, people will help you. There are lots of amazing people out there. Um, so I don't know what I might say yes to in the next hmm. 10 years. I love journalism. Uh, I certainly see myself still in journalism. Um, I hope that I can continue to uh, go overseas and to do those stories. Um, I hope that I can continue to cover politics because I love it. Um, but I don't, I don't really know exactly what that looks like. I just think that um, I love this job. I do it even if nobody paid me. I can't believe people do pay me to do it. Mm. Um, and I look forward to, to continuing to do that and just kind of seeing where it takes me because the wildest ride for me has been all of the ones that I haven't planned. Yeah, no, I'm, it's so interesting to see how your career has evolved and how you've, you know, shared that now and like, anything is still possible. And I, I don't know how old you are actually, but I, oh, I, I can tell you, I'm, I just oh. turned 40. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I just turned 38, but now I want you to live in Calgary. I don't want you to go back to Ottawa ever. And I just want us to My be family friends. would like that very much. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can have all of these interesting conversations about foreign policy and like, um, IBMs and, you know, nuclear um proliferation and um because and i there are these are the conversations that i think a lot of women want to have and for so long we've been told you know it's just been kind of like you get put in a box and you know you're supposed to stay in your box and we don't want to stay in our boxes like that's the opposite we want to be let out and uh you know to talk about you know the best new nail polish maybe and then but also talk about um you know middle east peace like there's just that we don't want to be limited exactly and it's it's that artificially imposed limit that you know i i love to find ways around and encourage other women to find ways around okay they're going to block the front door cut a hole in the ceiling go through the yeah. wall like find another way um and 
and for me that's really stuck out recently in, in doing the military sexual misconduct stories these incredible women um and most of the women who who i've spoken to and who you've seen on camera are women in the combat arms infantry officers uh naval uh combat warfare officers um these are women in very non-traditional roles and what they have had to go through what they felt they couldn't talk about what was ignored when they bought, brought it forward um it's really really disturbing because these are the women who are saying yeah you know what i can be a woman i can be a mother um i can be all of these things and i can command troops in a theater of war eleanor taylor first woman in canadian history to command a company in war in afghanistan i've talked to the soldiers who she commanded and they think the world of her. Um, they just would, would lay down their lives in a second for Eleanor Taylor. Women can do it all. And I think that it's such a critical time for us to be talking about that and talking about the fact that what's happened to some of these women who can do it all and are doing it all, um, that has still tried to box them in, the institution ignoring what's happening, the fact that they've been preyed upon for their willingness to sacrifice and, and just try to be everything they're capable of being. Um, it reminds me, we still have a long way to go when I cover stories like that, but these women are so inspiring and incredible and strong and powerful and fearless, even in very difficult times. And I just mean being shot at, coming forward with these kinds of stories when you're inside that kind of a culture, um, more than one of these women has told me it's far scarier than any deployment that they've been on um so it's it's a reminder i think that we can we can do it all but there's still barriers in our way that should not be there uh, yes it is there's no reason that any woman should have to deal with that kind of those things happening in any in any workplace and the culture of like the military and um and it, it's in the RCMP too, as well as, you know, like, and you yeah. know what, I'm going to say it, it's in politics as well, is Absolutely. that you, you, um, there's a greater cause and you sacrifice yourself for it because, um, you know, it's, if it's not, you know, the reputation of the organization, it's, you know, that your boss is very important, right? All of these different things and the enormity of, you know, well, you don't want to be the one who ruins all of that do you yeah that's exactly that's exactly it that's exactly how they feel it's exactly what they tell themselves it's exactly what other people have overtly told them and I think this watershed moment kind of hit where people went you know what attacking our own troops from the inside why would we do that that has to stop. That's what it is. And it's the same, whether it's in politics, I know it happens in law, it happens in medicine. Mm -hmm. I've heard from women in all different career fields that, that you know, I, I remember Parliament Hill a decade ago, it was a different place. Um, I've been around the military a long time. And it's, you know, exactly that feeling that women are afraid to say something because it'll make it worse instead of better. And frankly, for so many women who did say something over the years and it made it worse for them and it didn't make yeah. the institution better. And, and that's where they came from because you kind of need this critical mass uh, to happen to get that, that sort of institutional change and have people listen, which is really unfortunate, but the way that it's played out in, in a lot of different areas of life. And I spoke to one woman who is very prominent um, female officer probably lots of your listeners will know she did not want to go public and she called me and she was so upset because she said I feel like a traitor for years I told people it wasn't that bad it was that bad but I thought maybe if I just didn't say something if I could get to the table I could be the one to change it she wasn't hiding it because she was trying to protect the institution necessarily she thought they just don't understand and if I can get to the table then I can bring change um, and I talked to so many women who felt that, that like, if we can just get enough of us there, then we can make the change. And then sort of this realization that that didn't seem to be happening. It, it wasn't, it wasn't working. It wasn't changing the culture. Um, but I think it's so difficult because there's this sort of social construct around you as a woman that you're the peacemaker and, 
um, the, the one who's supposed to heal the wounds and bring people together. And then it's somehow divisive if you're the one who speaks out. And that for so many women, it was your career. You knew it. You'd be, you were the troublemaker. You were the one who said something. Why did you have to make it difficult? Why couldn't you just have talked to him about it? He just likes you. He's in love with you. I mean, so many of us have heard these kinds of lines. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's made it very, very difficult. I hope that, that change is, is happening, but um, it's really sad how many women have given so much of themselves to so many different causes in this country um, and felt they were not able to speak out, not just felt they weren't able to speak out, knew there would have been very real consequences if they spoke out um, and that they would have been blamed for harming something they loved. So instead they internalized it mm -hmm. um, and had to accept mistreatment. And I hope that won't be the case you know, for your children's generation and for the next generation coming up behind us, things are going to change. I really hope so, because I, I do think it's the decision makers at the table and, you know, having changing up who is at the table is part of it, but also thinking about, you know, um, okay, so then the table is, the table looks different, you know, the table is trying to change things, but then down below in the ranks of, you know, officers and, you know, all of those people, it's how do you, we also have to address what they bring to the job, right? Because it's not just the culture of the organization, but it's also their own personal cultures. And so, um, you know, how they were raised, were they, were they, you know, do they have a respect for, for all cultures? Do they have an understanding of, um, diversity and inclusion? Do they think that women are equal? Um, because, you know, if, if it's, if, the, if we're not addressing, I think that as well, then the table is just one part, the table is one part of it. But um, because, I mean, we see it in the military, um, there are people within Canada's military who who have views that would be considered extremist and, you know, um, and and they're they're in the ranks. And so how do you how do you balance that and how do you reconcile that and how do you address it? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of it's the, the message the military sends. I mean, any large organization uh, and particularly one like the military and you'll hear sociologists talk about this you know why certain personality types uh, mm -hmm. might be drawn to that um, I also think you know one the military has to they have to deal with this in a very serious way mm -hmm. and it hasn't just been the problem in the ranks it's been the problem that the senior ranks say one thing and they do something else that yeah like don't do this but how it's okay I'm going to turn a blind eye exactly how seriously you should be taking it. Um, and I think that I've talked to a lot of troops, a lot, and they're, they're profoundly, in many cases, embarrassed um, that this is not how they want their institution to be. It, it's not the vast majority in the institution. It's the systemic institutional problems that are projected. Um, and it creates a double problem because when you have a problem um, with these kinds of views within the ranks or these kinds of activities at the highest ranks, that sends a message to people who might be thinking about joining your organization who in the long term will change the culture um, mm -hmm. because they won't want to join. And that is a problem. And I think the military um, didn't really honestly look at like, why aren't we getting women joining? Why are we having trouble uh, with with diversity and inclusion on such a large scale. Um, and you know, the vast, vast majority of the troops who I've had contact with are just phenomenal people. They're, they're willing to put their lives in the line for the country. They care about how well someone can do the job, not uh, their gender or their religion or their background or their ethnicity. Um, but the reality is that the message in the institution um, that's being, sorry, was being sort of broadcast. Uh, there was a perception, there was a lack of sincerity there. Um, and they're making promises to change all of this. Um, I hope that's the case. I really do. I have some deep concerns. Uh, mm. When I see, you know, uh, General Carignan appointed to this new position on culture and misconduct, um, but no speaking role at the press conference, 
what's that? I had to ask her a question to get an answer. She, she was not given a speaking role. We had a bunch of MPs who had a speaking role. That's great. Problem's not the MPs. That's a whole yeah. other story. And I don't mean military police, I mean members of parliament. Mm -hmm. um, and here is this woman, Lieutenant General, sitting there. And no one thought maybe she should make some comments. Yeah, that's that, bad. that bothered me. And so mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I kind of mean tweeted them about that. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think that there is a sincere desire uh, by by some to change. But then you see something like that and you think maybe it was just hastily put together. I don't know. Like, I don't know the background. It seems obvious. Happening. It seems obvious that she would but have I, a speaking role, that she would say something. You think you might want to hear from her. And, and you know, they're saying, well, it's very early on and she doesn't know what her role looks like yet, which she herself was saying. Um, but, you know, perhaps you could have put some thoughts together on what you think it mm -hmm. should look like. Um, and there's people who say, you know, Jenny Carrying on did not want that job. She wanted to be the army commander. Would it have been a more powerful signal to have a woman army commander than to have put a woman into this job because she's a woman to deal with culture? On the other hand, she has a, a perspective uh, and she is a woman combat arms officer uh, who served in Afghanistan. So, uh, you know, you can kind of see both sides on it. But to me, that, that rankled me. I often don't share opinions as a journalist, but I thought that if you're going to create that job and introduce her and promote her that morning and forget to even announce you promoted her, um, that to me raises questions about the sincerity. And that's our job as journalists is to then push and say, why, why wasn't her mic working? Why didn't she have a speaking role? Um, you know, why hadn't you figured out what her job was two and a half months into this? Um, and, and that's where our role as journalists comes up to ask those questions and, and kind of push. Yeah. And thank you for pushing because, um, well, and I mean, it kind of, it makes me think back to our, our, our earlier conversation about, you know, how tightly the messages are controlled nowadays. Um, and so like there had to be some thought about that from, you would think, given how tightly controlled messages are. And obviously this is probably part of the approach about tightly controlling the message, but also it just looks really bad, right? Like. It well, has like the no opposite one had effect. Realized it would even look bad. It's like no one had realized that maybe someone might question this. Um, and maybe it was just that they were really rushed. But I mean, uh, being promoted to lieutenant general, it's a big, it's a big, big deal. That's like a three-star general. Um, to have not mentioned the only reason we found out she was promoted is because they kept calling her Lieutenant General Carrying off. I was oh. like, huh? I thought she was a major general. And so it kind of wrote an email like, hi. General Caring, y'all get promoted. Oh yeah, 9 a.m. this morning. Oh. You didn't oh, want to mention oh. it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I know there were people who were very chagrined about that in, in DND too. But um, I mean, I hope the, the desire to change is, is sincere, but this can't just be uh, throw titles out there kind of thing. Yeah. 2015 is what that was, right? Blah, 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 commitment, operation, honor. Um, it never made the systemic change that it could have. We still haven't implemented um, things that were very clearly recommended in 2015. And even now, the government could have said, okay, right now we're committing to have an officer who reports to parliament outside the chain of command. Like, I, I don't really understand um, what the reluctance is there politically. I understand it on the military side, the, the concern about losing control. I don't so much understand it on the political side. And I think that it's a problem for this government because they've branded themselves as a feminist government. This is an issue that a feminist government should be seized with, with more than just saying over and over again, it's very important. Uh, I understand they want to make sure they get it right and it's not something you want to rush. Um, but, you know, I don't really consider it rushing if you were to have seriously looked at recommendations you should have been looking at over the last six years. Yeah. And, you know, oh, the inner workings of politicians and the politics of the politics of the politics, right? And why so many things that you would logically assume are the right things to do, like, you know, clean water for all, you know, Indigenous communities who have been on boil water advisories for 20 years. Like, that also seems like, do you, I don't understand those things. So this gets added to the list of why is nothing happening? Yeah. Yeah. We just have to keep asking those 
those questions on those important files. Uh, and the indigenous one is, is huge, as you mentioned, you know, and um, I know this is a government that has done a lot in terms of fulfilling promises, but they've also fallen tremendously short on those promises too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're, we're a first world country and we still have boil water advisories and children who can't go to school in the communities that they're from, they have to be ripped out at a young age and sent into cities and towns where they don't yeah. know anybody uh, know. to go to school. And I still think that's that's really widely not known in Canada. Um, I read Tanya Talaga's book, Seven Fallen Feathers, um, and it was so eye-opening for me, even beyond having covered stuff on the Indigenous Beat. I'm by no means an expert, but I covered Idle No More and I'd heard you know, commentary on this, but the depth that book gave me in terms of understanding what was happening like I could not imagine being told that if I wanted to go to high school I had to leave my parents when I was 14 and move far away and in with somebody who maybe I didn't know and not a lot of adult supervision um, and all of these social pressures um, in a place I've never been and it's just really really heartbreaking that that's still happening yeah we're continuing to you know brutalize Canada's Indigenous peoples with policies that are just, you know, hurtful. It's, it's, I feel like we could talk all day about so many <laughs> different things, um, because you are so intensely fascinating and so oh, you're incredibly, very, you're very kind. Can I like, put that on my business card? <laughs> yes. You can tell your bosses. People on Twitter don't think so. This woman with a podcast told me <laughs> Um, she deserves, I deserve a raise. Yeah. Um, so I just, I, I feel like we could just talk for a very long time. Um, which goes back to, uh, what well, I want to be friends with you <laughs> because you are, I would love to be friends with you. Oh, thanks. Um, because you are, you are really, really cool and really, really fascinating. And I am so thankful that you said yes to doing this and to being on elected um, and, uh, maybe, you know, next year or some other time, I'd love to have you back on and we can talk about things and maybe do a kind of like a catch up and do a recap of what we talked about today. And maybe hopefully things have changed in some ways. I, I would, I would love to come back, Sarah. And I just want to say thank you for everything that you're doing for women in politics. Um, I didn't know who you actually were for a long time. Like who was, <laughs> this mysterious person behind Madame Premier. Uh, but I loved what you were doing. And I Thanks. am just so excited to finally get to talk to you. You're mm -hmm. inspiring so many women and so many young women. Um, and you've created this wonderful feeling of community uh, and support and cross-partisan support for women in politics. And it's really, really important for our country and our democracy and for women. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. And I am just so honored to have been a guest on your Aww. podcast. And I'm thrilled you have one. And I will be listening to all of them. Thank you. That's so very, very generous and kind of you to say. And um, one day when we can like travel for fun again, um, and you can go back to like chasing down politicians in the hallway, <laughs> I would love to join you. And I will, uh, like, I want to, I want to tail you. I want to be embedded with you <laughs> so I can fun. like see the process and be like, yeah, what she said. <laughs> um, <laughs> You can read, you can yell the question some more when they ignore me and walk away. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you don't want to answer Mercedes. I'm going to ask you too, because this question deserves to be answered. No, I honestly feel like doing this now, I get to live out my fantasy of being a reporter, um, having the background as like a political staffer and then being, you know, the one who you, you go and you prepare and, you know, you don't want to, you try to figure out how to answer the tough questions, but being on the other side, I think is I mean, both sides are so great, but yeah, asking the questions is like so satisfying. And um, so in some way I, you know, I'm not asking like killer questions, but this is like my, my kind of intro to, to live, to filling that, to filling that jug inside of myself of wanting to have that experience. So thank you for um, coming on elected and um I'm again just so thankful that you said yes and let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. Thank you. 
This was elected. Thanks for listening today. And of course, a thank you to Mercedes Stevenson for joining me, Sarah Elder Chaminara, as we discuss women in and around politics. Until next time.